we're going to start our discussion of John of Salisbury. And I've never actually watched this movie, but going back over this material again made me think I ought to watch it. It's a movie called Beckett, and it's about the times, the life and times of uh, Thomas Beckett. And, and John of Salisbury was attached to Beckett and, and was at court, uh, the court of Henry II. And so it was a part of that history and kind of gives you a feel for that whole, the whole conflict that developed between Henry, who's played by Richard Burton in this movie, and Beckett, played by Peter O'Toole. So it's a classic. And I think I've been meaning to watch this movie for most of my life. And it's one of those ones that I haven't gotten to yet. I hope it's on Netflix. Yeah, it is. OK, good, good. So I don't have to pay for it. <laughs> I've, I've totally gone over to, um, I don't have cable, you know, or I don't use cable. Um, I have Netflix, Hulu Plus, and Amazon. And among all three of those, I get everything I want, but I don't. Then I look at Netflix first because I don't want to have to pay for it. <laughs> um, all right, so excellent. So you must have seen it. Well, I'm pretty sure I saw it when I was going through uh, uh, just like the list of movies. I, saw, I remember that picture of the cover, so. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, you know. It sort of reminds me, the conflict that developed between Beckett and Henry reminds me of the conflict that developed between Thomas More and Henry VIII much later on in the 16th century, which ended up, um, of course, with the split with the Catholic Church. And actually, we'll see, at this time, there was some inkling of that. There was a split of sorts. It didn't, uh, it didn't amount to a complete break, but there was a... a you know, a struggle between church and state, so to speak, here. And, uh, you know, this was a characteristic, and what I tried to make clear uh, last time we met was it was a characteristic of the uh, medieval scene, was a sort of constant power struggle between church and state. And so this is one dramatic example of it. But, but the writings that we have are from John of Salisbury, who was, as I said, attached to um, Beckett, at a certain point, um, and before that, he was attached to Archbishop Theobald of Canterbury. So, um, in fact, from his association with that archbishop, he was then attached to Beckett. So, John, as far as we know, was not of noble birth, but he either had enough money from family to be able to attend University of Paris, or he was gifted and talented enough to be able to be supported in doing so, because he did study uh, from 1136 to 1147 and was at the university at a time when there was a lot of humanistic uh, philosophers and theologians. There was a lot, of, uh, a lot going on there and he obviously picked up on it. As you read his work, you'll realize that he's well versed in, in uh, Greek and Roman um, philosophy and theology and so forth and it, it comes out all over the place in his writings. So after his education, he was able to obtain a job as secretary and advisor to Archbishop Theobald. And there he remained. And as a result of his association with the Archbishop, he was frequently at court. But there was a certain point where he was on the outs at court. And uh, the introduction in your book says they aren't sure why, but actually probably it, it, it seems pretty clear that John always had a little bit of an edge to him, so to speak, as far as he wasn't willing to just sort of accept things. He, he was a critic of sorts. And one of the things that he did uh, was write a satirical poem when Beckett, uh, Thomas Beckett, who also worked for the Archbishop, became chancellor <coughs> to the king, the chief advisor to Henry. and. John wrote this poem sort of warning Beckett that he would likely become corrupt and that, you know, life at court was, was a very dangerous life and, and full of, you know, full of problems. So it could be, just could be, that uh, John was known enough as somebody who uh, looked askance at Beckett's choice and at, at some of the court uh, politics to be unpopular. Uh, so 
uh, he was not welcome for a while, and it was during this period of time that he wrote the two pieces that you have excerpts from, um, the Polycraticus and Metalogicon. And uh, so it's kind of interesting because just like Machiavelli, who in many ways is his opposite, but not entirely, you know, he did work on these pieces during a time when he was not particularly welcome politically. And the pieces that he wrote didn't necessarily help his case. Um, but nevertheless, surprisingly, this didn't ruin his career permanently. Okay? So we'll talk more about what uh, these works are all about in a bit. But uh, when his benefactor, the Archbishop Theobald, died, um, Thomas Becket was named the new Archbishop. And this would have been not by King Henry, but by the Pope. Okay? So uh, Tom, er, John continued to work at the Archbishop's court for the new Archbishop. Okay? Now this was going to be a problem for him. He actually liked the first one better than the second one. He doesn't seem to have, for whatever reason, been as pleased with Thomas. Um, maybe it was partly Thomas's rigidity, because um, Thomas Becket was really about the church's authority and the church's prerogatives, and he was kind of a rigid man. And as you'll see from reading John, he was a kind of a highly educated, fairly open-minded um, person, and perhaps their personalities uh, did not mesh up, but he continued to work for him. And when Becket had this famous clash with Henry, um, John therefore was associated with Becket and could have been in more big trouble. Okay? Um, the issues between Archbishop Becket and Henry II were these. <coughs> Becket did not want to fall under the power of the king. He didn't want the church in England to be subject to the king's authority. And Henry, just like his namesake later on was very keen that he be in charge and not be thwarted by the will of the Pope. He didn't uh, propose to split with the Catholic Church, but he was not liking the idea that the Pope could overrule him or could take an, an interfering stance in his affairs through the Archbishop. So there was that. Becket also wanted to collect taxes within the lands it owned for the Church. Okay. So he wanted to treat the church lands as his own fiefdom um, and not share those revenues with the king, okay? saying that this is my land, this is the church's land, in other words, and we should keep the taxes that we raise from people who live there. And um, also, of course, he didn't want to allow jurisdiction in English courts when church officials were involved. So if church <coughs> officials were charged they should be charged by the church. They should be immune, in other words, from state prosecution because in church lands, he felt that the church should be the one to, uh, if they needed, prosecute and judge, okay? So in other words, he wanted sovereignty, more or less, for, for the church in the areas that it, that it owned, that it governed. Um, and Henry, of course, didn't want to allow that, and I'm sure you can see why, you know. He's the sovereign. It's his country, right? So, you know, as I've, as I've told you many times, the church for a long time was a political as well as a spiritual entity. It had lands, it had power, and it had spiritual authority on its side, and oftentimes it took this attitude that, you know, what's ours is ours, and, and it's not under your jurisdiction. And furthermore, uh, sometimes went farther than that, saying that you're under our jurisdiction. So there was a power clash uh, between the two. And Henry, on his part, tried to weaken the, church, the English church's ties to Rome, tried to get um, the other church officials in England to side with him. Okay? So there was a, a battle going on for the hearts and minds of priests and you know bishops and so on and so forth for which which side would would they go with okay and um, so knowing that he was perhaps in danger um, Thomas Beckett, Archbishop Beckett 
fled to France where he was protected and John went with him. And so they, they basically sought asylum there and obtained it. Okay? And from France, Beckett continued to wage his little personal war with Henry, okay? um, trying to get uh, the clergy in England to side with him against the king okay? and threatening them. And he did excommunicate many of them um, if they did not support his position about the church's power. Now, does everybody understand what the, what the power of excommunication means? And for the Catholic, excommunication means being cut off from God's grace. Basically, you can't receive communion, you can't receive uh, confession, the sacrament of confession, etc. So you're just cut off. Okay. So this was a very powerful threat, and you can see the extent to which, you know, this was a, a pitched battle. Um, on the other hand, Henry had the power of the sword, and so he was definitely threatening, you know to actually kill some of these people. But instead, he ended up killing Beckett. Uh, Beckett was assassinated at a distance in 1170, um, which took care of the immediate threat of uh, disorder for Henry, but made Beckett a real hero amongst uh, the clergy. And so and the Catholic Church canonized him because he was standing up for the the you know the prerogatives of the church against the king. Okay? So he was made a saint shortly after his death. Um, now what's interesting to me, and I'm not sure I see a very good explanation for this, but just because Beckett was or John was attached to Beckett and fled with him, in other words, was associated very much with Beckett, didn't mean that John was also either killed or ex. Uh, Ex exiled. Okay. Now, a truly Machiavellian ruler would probably do one or the other. Okay. But perhaps because John was never a great fan of Beckett himself, um, I don't know. But anyway, he was allowed back into England, and not only that, but he continued to work for the church and was eventually allowed to be appointed bishop. Now, of course, he was appointed by the church. Um, and not by the king, although the king would have liked to have had the power to do that. Okay. But nevertheless, the king allowed these things to happen. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Despite his association with Beckett, and also despite his writings, which were um, somewhat critical of the type of power that Henry wielded, as we'll see. Not so much in Metalogicon. We see it more like his personality and the way that he thinks. But in Polycraticus, which is about you know, his political thought, we see he has pretty high expectations for rulers. And he doesn't want rulers to wield their power just because they have it, but legitimately and with certain virtues. So um, you know, Henry might not have measured up to his standards. Okay. So we have these two excerpts. Metalogicon means about learning or about wisdom. Polycraticus can have two meanings, which is kind of interesting. Um, just kind of like Thomas More's book, Utopia, can mean happy place and no place. Right? Polycraticus can mean many rule, which, which might imply the people rule, or it can mean the many types of regimes or ways of rule. And maybe John <coughs> meant for there to be a double meaning there. Because though he doesn't advocate democracy, in that work he does advocate ruling for the people and a different view of, of what government is for, that it should be for the welfare of the people. Um, and so you have to wonder about his choice of titles. Any questions about the history, the background going on at this time? I like it. I like to talk about it a little bit because it does demonstrate that, um, I don't know, you know, sometimes I think students are taught um, the church reigned supreme throughout the Middle Ages and told kings what to do, and that's just not true. There were, they were always butting heads. 
and kings never did appreciate you know the church attempting to interfere they did take it seriously and they took excommunication seriously in a lot of cases but they still fought back against too much church interference and the church very much tried to have as much of its own sway as possible too so this constant butting of heads is partly what you know led later on to this distinction between clear distinction between church and state between religion and politics it took the protestant reformation for us to get more of a notion of the separation of church and state going. And it took a long, long time uh, to go that far. But this tension between religion and politics, church and state, had, had been around a long time. So we have a short excerpt, excerpt from Metalogicon. And first, before we get into it at all, I just wanted to ask you what your general impressions were of this work. What kind of a man does, does he seem to be when you read this? Religious? Secular? Smart? <coughs> pious? This was written in the 12th century. Was there anything kind of surprising about it for you that kind of leaped out there? I remember that, you know, the, the Middle Ages was, the, the early Middle Ages were the Dark Ages, so to speak. You know, after the Roman Empire crumbled at first, it was returned to the barbarians, basically. The, the, and, you know, there wasn't much in the way of literacy, the economy collapsed, and so forth. But as these kingdoms began to consolidate, uh, you know, they, be, they began to consolidate in wealth and power. And by the time we get to the late Middle Ages, you have great courts. You have people of great learning. You've got the rediscovery of the of the of the Greek and Roman classics. Right? You have the universities, the University of Paris, where he went to, for instance. Um, so he had at his disposal, through his education and his associations, a lot of resources. Okay. So. I would expect it would come as kind of a surprise to you that somebody from this time period could be this sophisticated and highly educated because the writing is quite clearly very, uh, it's, it's the 12th century, but he's writing as a humanist basically. He's, he's very well informed by philosophy. He, uh, he's obviously um, what we call, oh, I'm going to mess up the term, but he, he's syncretistic I think is the term. He takes both theology and philosophy and even um, ancient um, religions and mixes them all together. Okay? And that was uh, that way of, of thinking and writing you can find from this point on, amongst other ways. Okay? Um, but this was a man who, who claimed to be religious, but in this uh, brief selection that we have in, in, in all of Metalogicon, <coughs> you have an awful lot of references to philosophy and actually to some uh, pagan um, figures as well. Okay, For instance, on the second page, on page 29, he references Mercury, the god of eloquence. Okay? Now, during the Protestant Reformation, this was a big issue, writings like this, that were done by Catholics, because Protestants didn't like this level of philosophical sophistication. They thought it was evil because it was influenced by paganism, by the ancients, you know, before the influence of Christianity. And so writings like this were a sign of the corruption of the Catholic faith. Okay? So the fact that a writer would, you know, and he doesn't name Aristotle, but clearly Aristotle has influenced him, so he references Aristotle here. Um, and mentions the, the god of, of uh, eloquence, Mercury, right? Um, though he does it in a lighthearted way, right? He's, he doesn't believe in Mercury, so to speak, but well, kind of interesting. <coughs> and uh, you know, just kind of to give you a heads up, it became a problem for the, one of the, one of the reputation issues with the church during the Protestant Reformation. So, how he depicts human nature, 
is very Aristotelian. Okay? Clearly, he's learned Aristotle at university because he says at the beginning of Metalogicon, chapter one, there, um, to all those who are truly, to all who are truly wise, there is no doubt that nature, the most merciful parent, at the best disposed moderator of all affairs, has raised up human beings among other animated creatures it has brought forth by the privilege of reason and has distinguished them by the faculty of eloquent speech, arranging by obliging diligence and well-disposed law that man who is burdened and drawn down by the weight of base nature and the sluggishness of the bodily mass may rise to the heights, borne aloft as though by beating wings, and that by this, unfor this fortunate advantage he may surpass all others in obtaining the pinnacle of true happiness. That is a philosophical statement, not a religious statement. Okay? It's basically Aristotelian. He's saying that we are distinguished from the brute creatures by our reason and our eloquent speech. That we, and there's a little bit of Plato in here too, because the, our bodily mass can drag us down, but we are lifted up or made better <coughs> by our reason and our speech. This is what can make us, can lift us up and, and make us different from and surpass the animals. Okay. What is not there is a pious statement about how only God's grace can possibly save us from our horrible sinful nature, okay? which is something that you hear much more of a little later on from Catholic thinkers and then from Protestants. He says, therefore, while grace makes nature fertile, natural reason watches over the investigations and examination of various matters, searches the inner depths of nature, and measures the fruits and accomplishments of individual persons. And by the love of goodness innate in everyone, not original sin is emphasized, but the love of goodness innate in everyone, urged along by one's natural appetites, reason strives entirely or above all else for that which seems to be well suited to taking hold of true happiness. So reason can be the path to happiness, which is the ancient path. Okay. Um, since no one who is unaware of communal life or who stands outside society can ever conceive, even conceive of true happiness, whoever attacks that which brings about the unification and fostering of the right of human society would seem to obstruct everyone's path to the attainment of happiness. And the route to peace is so blocked that the depths of nature combine to incite the destruction of the world. So human society okay, is the path to happiness. Uh, and it's the right of all people. We are social creatures. Another Aristotelian uh, teaching. All right, so <coughs> reason and speech make us better than the animals. The highest pursuit for human beings is virtue. Okay. And while this goes along with the Christian view, you know, that a Christian ought to pursue righteousness, his writing indicates that it's through our own human efforts that we can attain virtue. So he's he's highly influenced. Remember that. You know, Augustine said, you know, beware of philosophy because philosophy will make you arrogant and think that you can solve, um, you know, your problems on your own. And here we have John of Salisbury sort of doing that, basically. He's, he leans towards philosophy and towards the idea that we can indeed do a lot for ourselves. He's not denying that God is ultimately at the bottom of things, that God is, is what we ultimately can find through the pursuit of reason and, and virtue. Um, but there's no emphasis on only through uh, belief can we be saved. Okay? And that's kind of interesting. Um, at the bottom of page 28, oh, see. he says, for those who are blessed without the merits of virtue, do not so much attain to it by themselves as are carried off to it. Consequently, I do not marvel enough, because I cannot at what is intended by someone who denies the elo that eloquent speech is to be studied and who asserts it 
to arise from nature as a gift to those who are not mute, just as sight is a gift to those who are not blind or hearing to those who are not deaf, etc. <coughs> so he begins to speak of eloquent speech and the gift of eloquent speech allowing us this path to virtue. It's the path that grace, he says, has provided, which would be a reference to God's grace. In other words, God has given us reason and eloquent speech, which has allowed us this path to virtue and happiness. Okay? So that's how he brings together um, God and philosophy. Okay? So you find God in a few places here. He, he discusses, for instance, the creative trinity and the one and true God who has ordered the parts of the universe for the sake of a more firmly joined connection and protective charity. Um, but you don't find lots of references to God. In fact, that might be the only one direct reference. Um, do you find any scripture quotations? Would you expect to? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Um, there aren't any in this particular excerpt, anyway. Um, and throughout the work, it is not emphasized. Okay. Uh, later on, other thinkers, you know, taking the opposite point of view, um, pretty much relied on scripture. Okay. So there were two ways of dealing with with the subject matter. One was John's way and the other was, you know, was to rely heavily on scripture. And then there's a third way, which is Thomas Aquinas' way, which we'll deal with next week, which does try to evenly balance the two. Okay? Um, Thomas Aquinas was about 50-50. He claimed that, um, that if the two clashed, theology trumped philosophy. But he also claimed that rightly understood philosophy couldn't do that, couldn't clash with it, because rightly understood it shouldn't, because God made the world in a certain way to be understood by people, and okay, not to fool people. So we've already kind of discussed what inspires John, his education, um, his love of philosophy, obviously. Now, we need to talk a little bit more about how he viewed the eloquence of speech and why that was important, because he spends the, the second half of this excerpt talking about um, the eloquent speech and why it's so valuable to people. Okay? And by which he means it's a reference to rhetoric. Okay? Now, the stuff that we've tended to study, uh, like the Gorgias in the Intro to Political Thought class and and uh, the Republic in this class tend to be critical of rhetoric and rhetoricians because of the connection of rhetoric with, with the politicians. Okay. But Cicero, for instance, whom John of Salisbury also read, a Roman thinker, was very positive about the use of rhetoric and, and wrote books about um, the proper use of rhetoric and how it could be used rightly and not abused and so forth. And John of Salisbury seems to side more with Cicero and with the view that rhetorical speech is very important because it inspires people to continue to learn. He thinks that you can't really get a, an atmosphere and a culture of learning without eloquence, without the ability to communicate ideas well, and to communicate them as broadly as possible, for which you need rhetoric. So in this little excerpt, he references Cornifia, Cor, Cornifius, ah, I'll never pronounce it, Cornifius, um, who was critical of rhetoric, a Roman thinker. Um, and he argues against his point of view that rhetoric is harmful. Okay? And so he probably also argues against the Platonic view of rhetoric that it's mainly harmful. Remember, Plato really, really uh, distinguished between philosophy and rhetoric. You know, the two were not to be combined, even though he did do that a little bit in spots, but um, they're two separate things. Philosophy is much higher than rhetoric. It doesn't need rhetoric, okay? Rhetoric is, is, is uh, often abused, okay? So 
John disagrees with the Platonic view of rhetoric, agrees more with Cicero's praise of rhetoric. Okay? And in doing this, he's disagreeing with other theologians of his day that did not like this so much use of philosophy and references to mythological figures and so forth that people like John were employing. So he reveals the, the clash between his way of doing things and the more strict sort of um, dual approach to theology that existed too at the same time. So right here you start to see a distinction and a split in how do you approach you know, theology and how do you write about religion and how do you write about morality. Okay? And even in his time there were plenty of people who didn't like his approach and didn't think much of rhetoric. But obviously in his own writing he's very eloquent. He uses emotion. Okay? He tries to lift the reader up through really lofty language okay, to inspire people. Um, and he very much champions this approach. Um, so he says on page 29, he who excludes the lessons of eloquence from the study of philosophy begrudges philology, which is the study of the classical languages and the classics. Okay. Begrudges philology to Mercury, the god of eloquence, and tears Mercury from the embrace of philology. And although he may seem only to persecute eloquent speech, he disrupts all liberal studies. He assails all the works of every one of the philosophers. He breaks apart the covenant of human society and he leaves behind no opportunity for charity or reciprocity of duties. Wow, you know, kind of hard to figure out exactly what he's saying there, isn't it? I think he sees some of these more rigid people who, who want to be in their scholarship, be very obscure, for instance, to be very rigid in their approach, to uh, not be eloquent, okay? Just as in our own day, there are certain scholars who write articles that are pretty much incomprehensible, right? Because they use an excessive amount of scholarly jargon and so they exclude so many people from their scholarship and they write only for a few and the discussions about those ideas are very dry and not terribly inspiring okay in the same way i think john is targeting theologians of his day who have the same attitude this is not for people this is not this is for the few this is a serious matter that needs to be discussed in this, you know, very rigid kind of uh, formulaic way, okay? <coughs> and uh, you know, excluded a lot of people, even very literate people, uh, from discussions about theology and about morality. So he's basically saying this, this attitude works against, um, really, human society itself because you're excluding people and you're not spreading learning and you're not inspiring people, okay? So it's a very different attitude. He says, human beings become beasts if they are deprived of the gift of speech granted to them and their cities would seem rather like enclosures for livestock than assemblies of human beings joined together by a certain covenant so that by its law they may live according to the shared duties and reciprocal friendship with one another. That, that's another reference to the Aristotelian teaching, in this case on friendship. In order to have two, true friendship and to have true citizenship, you have to have common values and common understanding. In order to do that, you have to have as much common education, common knowledge as possible. So if you have an elite that sort of locks up knowledge and makes it incomprehensible or makes it unattractive, then a lot of humanity, again, is not lifted up, is not happy, is not really fully human. Okay? So he's a humanist, a very, very early humanist. Um, 
who thinks that learning needs to be more widespread and can be, and perhaps through his own experience, because he was not, as I said, a member of the noble class, and yet somehow he managed to uh, get an education and become influential anyway. All right, so any questions about that brief selection, <coughs> what that all means? I know that's a little bit hard to understand, but I'm trying to emphasize it because it's so different than what you expect, first of all, and it's so different from what came later, you know. A lot of people kind of think the Protestant Reformation put us on the path to reason and on the path to the scientific revolution and so forth, but if you study the, the you know, medieval writings, you find that there was a split in thinkers, and a lot of thinkers in the Catholic tradition were very open to learning and admiring of reason and very critical of, of government and even of, as we'll see with John, members of, of the church as well, <coughs> capable of independent thought okay? and, and not as focused upon sin and degradation and guilt as uh, we might think. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Pol Polycraticus, and we'll, we've got about maybe 10 minutes or so left here. We can at least get into it a little bit, okay? So it's the longer <coughs> excerpt that you have, and one thing just to point out right at the beginning, going along with what we've talked about already, here's some of the sources that he cites, okay? Very heavily influenced by his by his learning of the ancient text. So he cites Homer, you know, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Plato, Aristotle, Ovid, okay, who gave us, um, oh, what is it called? It's a great mythology, uh, Roman mythology. Plutarch, Virgil, Varro, that, that's who was cited by Augustine as somebody who was cataloging all the different uh, ways that one could be happy, okay? He also cites St. Paul, whom he calls the Gentile teacher and various biblical texts. So here in this work he combines citations of a lot of these pagan authors with the Bible. Okay? Um, also to note, just so that you understand, he uses the term republic, but in this translation he's just referring to government. He's not advocating for what we would call a republican government, so don't let that confuse you. Okay? He does believe that government should be for the people's welfare. But that's not, that doesn't mean that people are represented directly, necessarily. Okay? All right, so. Major theme. Government can be an instrument of God's will. Now remember, Augustine definitely agreed with this. Augustine said this. In fact, he said government is always the instrument of God's will. You know, even when terrible things happen, even when people are dominated by a tyrant, it must be for a purpose. In that case, it would be to punish them for sins that they've committed or to, to make them humble, to make them more <coughs> heaven than earth or something. There's got to be some reason. Right. Now, John somewhat agrees with Augustine's view of this but not totally. Okay? As we'll see, he does think government can be an instrument of God's will, but it isn't always an instrument of God's will. Major difference that uh, brings about the ability to criticize government. If you take Augustine's stance seriously, you really can't say much about it, right? Because if everything's a matter of God's will and has some sort of God's purpose, then, you know, all you can do is maybe lament the problem, the human condition, but you can't do that much about it. What we have with John is something quite different. But he does say, you know, one instance uh, which he discusses is a very good one, the best as a matter of fact, is when a good king, a benevolent king, rules over a good people. Now by good, he doesn't mean sinless, but people who have good intentions and who are honest and decent and attempting to live good lives, okay? Now, a good king for him means a king who rules by the laws and isn't arbitrary, in other words, isn't a law in and of himself, but has established laws and rules by them and is also subject to them. 
Now, that's different from certainly Henry or most other English kings before or after. They would have, you know, maybe paid lip service to the idea that they ruled under the law and also were subject to the law, but actually most of them didn't <coughs> and would not have liked the idea that they could be subjected to the law. So right there, John gives us a standard that goes against what most kingdoms actually, what they did, what, how they operated. Okay. He also says that a benevolent king, a good king, is a sort of image of divinity. In other words, he represents God. Not, not directly. Um, he's not saying that the king is sort of God on earth, but rather that he should represent through his actions God's will. You know, he should be a good example by being a good Christian. Okay. And he describes such a king on page 52. He says, um, he acts rightly, this is on the bottom, he acts rightly when he raises the church to the apex, so it's somebody who supports the church, when he extends the practice of religion, when he humiliates the proud and exalts the humble. Not something that happened a lot. Uh, when he is generous to the destitute, more frugal with the wealthy. When justice walks constantly before him and sets his course on the way of prudence and all other virtues. So there we have definitely John's Christianity coming through. This is what Christianity means to John, okay, is taking care of the poor, extending the practice of religion, uh, exalting the humble, you know, bringing down the proud. And these are values from the Bible, right? Um, so he wants a king, the best type of king does this. Now some of them did some of it some of the time, but it would be hard to find a king who did all of these things all of the time. So this is a pretty high standard. Um, he also says, very controversial, or it should have been anyway. A king isn't king, or a good king is not king, just because of lineage, in other words, just because he inherited his throne, but because of his merits. Okay? Such a person should be on the throne because of his merits, because he's that kind of person who is humble, who is charitable, you know, who, who wants to take care of his people, not simply because of um, who his father was. That's a pretty radical thought. Now, the way most people would have read that would, would be, you know, not to totally denounce uh, inherited rule, which was universal, okay? How, that's a pretty radical thought if that's what he was doing, basically saying, let's elect our kings or something like that. So most people wouldn't have read it that way. But they would have read it as, you know, I'm going to judge how well a king is doing on the basis not of his blood and birth, but on his actions. Okay. So, um, on page 34, he says, uh, but because according to reason kingship and priesthood are not generated of flesh and blood, since in founding either one, respect for lineage should not prevail apart from respect for the merits of the virtues, but the desire for the benefit of the faithful subjects should be prevalent. And when someone ascends to the summit atop either mountain, that is, kinghood or priesthood, he must be oblivious to carnal desires and must do only what is demanded for the welfare of those who are subject to him. So, and this theme continues that these standards apply not only to kings but to uh, clergy as well. Okay. Again, very high standard. Um, we really already discussed this, but the king, the ideal king, is subject to the law, and it has to be a good law. And also, he says, when he has to shed blood, and this is interesting for the just war theory that builds up through the Middle Ages. When he sheds blood, which every king has to do, he must do so with the sword of the dove. Okay? And the dove represents what? Peace. 
right peace, the Holy Spirit, right peace. And so, you know, what? Use the sword with the spirit of peace? Um, well, yes, actually, um, what he urges is that a good king should only use the sword to bring about peace with the intention of peace. I think we discussed when we, when we were dealing with Augustine how he doesn't get much past um, you know, rightful authority, um, but one of the things that he hints at is this idea that you have to have a proper intention, which needs to be peace. Well, John agrees with that. Uh, so whatever you do, and believe me, there, there's huge differences between actions and warfare um, intended to bring peace and establish peace and, and war, act, warlike actions that intend to bring revenge, for instance, or just, you know, destruction. And um, so he's saying that a good king keeps this uh, value in mind. Indeed, it's the sword of the dove, he says, which quarrels without bitterness, which slaughters without wrathfulness, and which, when fighting, entertains no resentment whatsoever. For since law will prosecute the blameworthy without personal animosity, the ruler most properly punishes transgressors, not according to some wrathful motive, but by the peaceful will of law. Okay. What do you think Machiavelli would say about that? Yeah. I would feel like in a way Machiavelli would agree, but would say that's not the only reason. Mm -hmm. would, I believe Machiavelli would say that you know you shouldn't just go to war like just because there should be like a greater purpose behind it. So that right. might be one of the purposes, like to make sure that your country stays peaceful. But it wouldn't be the only reason. It would also be like to gain territory, to to know your enemies, to gain wealth. So yeah, but I feel it might be he wouldn't say that's not a bad reason, but he would disagree saying that's the only. reason. Great, that's exactly right, yeah. Machiavelli, like John, wants the king to uh, have self-control, to not wage war out of hatred or revenge, or just because it feels good to you know, uh, dominate over others, but because you have a specific goal in mind and a goal that will make your, your power greater, safer, and so forth. But he does differ from John and that for John, the only aim should be peace. Would Machiavelli say that? No, probably not. That sounds a little bit too good for Machiavelli, right? Um, but John is urging the same type of self-restraint. You know, he's saying, keep your eye on the goal, but your goal should be peace. That's what it should be. And to that end, sometimes you have to wage war, you know. But um, unlike Machiavelli, the only aim should be peace, and true peace, okay? <coughs> Um, if you allow a transgressor to just roll over yourself or your neighbors um, in the name of peace, that's a false pacifism in a way. It's, it, it actually makes for more warfare and destruction. And so um, not only John, but many other thinkers in the Middle Ages did not believe pure pacifism was a moral choice because it actually leads, it leads to more destruction and, and more problems for people in the long run. Because then you see the ground, you see the territory to people who don't have any sort of moral standards. So it's interesting because um, that's where the rubber hits the road with, Christ, with the Christian moral teaching on questions like that. You know, is there ever um, a good reason to use uh, violence? Is there ever a good reason to go to war? 